The Virgin Suicides, Chapter 2 We didn't understand why Cecilia had killed herself the first time, and we understood even less when she did it twice. Her diary, which the police inspected as part of the customary investigation, didn't confirm the supposition of unrequited love. Dominic Palazzolo was mentioned only once in that tiny rice paper journal, illuminated with colored magic markers to look like a book of hours, or a medieval Bible. Miniature designs crowded the pages. Bubblegum angels swooped from top margins, or scraped their wings between teeming paragraphs. Maidens with golden hair dripped sea-blue tears into the book's spine. Grip-colored whales spouted blood around a newspaper item, pasted in, listing arrivals to the endangered species list. Six hatchlings cried from shattered shells near an entry made on Easter. Cecilia had filled the pages with a profusion of colors and curly cues, candyland ladders and striped shamrocks, but the entry about Dominic read, Palazzolo jumped off the roof today over that rich bitch, Porter. How stupid can you be? The paramedics came back again, the same two, though it took us a while to recognize them. Out of fear and politeness, we had moved across the street to sit on the hood of Mr. Larson's Oldsmobile. As we made our exit, none of us had said a word except for Valentine Stemorowski, who called across the lawn. Thank you for the party, Mr. and Mrs. Lisbon. Mr. Lisbon was still sunk in bushes up to his waist, his back jerking as though he were trying to pull Cecilia up and off, or as though he were sobbing. On the porch, Mrs. Lisbon made the other girls face the house. The sprinkler system, time to go on at 8.15 p.m., spurted into life just as the EMS truck appeared at the end of the block. Moving at about 15 miles an hour, without flashing lights or siren, as though the paramedics already knew it was hopeless. The skinny one, with the mustache, climbed out first, and the fat one. They got the stretcher immediately instead of first checking on the victim, a lapse which we later learned from medical professionals violated procedure. We didn't know who had called the paramedics, or how they knew they were no more than undertakers that day. Tom Farheem said Therese had gone inside and called, but the rest of us remember the remaining four Lisbon girls immobile on the porch until after the EMS truck arrived. No one else on our street was aware of what had happened. The identical lawns down the block were empty. Someone was barbecuing somewhere. Behind Joe Larson's house, we could hear a birdie being batted back and forth endlessly by the two greatest badminton players in the world. The paramedics moved Mr. Lisbon aside so they could examine Cecilia. They found no pulse, but went ahead trying to save her anyway. The fat one hacksawed the fence stake while the skinny one got ready to catch her because it was more dangerous to pull Cecilia off the barbed end than to leave it piercing her. When the stake snapped loose, the skinny one fell back under Cecilia's released weight. Then he regained his footing, pivoted, and slipped her onto the stretcher. As they carried her away, the sawed-off stake lifted the sheet like a tent post. By this time, it was nearly nine o'clock. From the roof of Chase Buell's house, we were congregated after getting out of our dressed-up clothes to watch what would happen next. We could see, over the heaps of trees throwing themselves into the air, the abrupt demarcation where the trees ended and the city began. The sun was falling in the haze of distant factories, and in the adjoining slums the scatter of glass picked up the raw glow of the smoggy sunset. Sounds we usually couldn't hear reached us now that we were up high and crouching on the tarred shingles, resting chins and hands, we made out faintly an indecipherable, backward-playing tape of city life. Cries and shouts, the barking of a chain dog, car horns, the voices of girls calling out numbers in obscure, tenacious games, sounds of an impoverished city we never visited, all mixed and muted, without sense, carried on a wind from that place. Then, darkness. Car lights moving in the distance. Up close, yellow house lights coming on, revealing families around televisions. One by one, we all went home. There had never been a funeral in our town before, at least not during our lifetimes. The majority of dying had happened during the Second World War when we didn't exist, and our fathers were impossibly skinny young men in black and white photographs. Dads on jungle airstrips, dads with pimples and tattoos, dads with pinups. 
Dads who wrote love letters to the girls who would become our mothers. Dads inspired by K-rations. Loneliness and glandular riot and malarial air into poetic reveries that ceased entirely once they got back home. Now our dads were middle-aged, with paunches and shins rubbed hairless from years of wearing pants. But they were still a long way from death. Their own parents, who spoke foreign languages and lived in converted attics like buzzards, had the finest medical care available and were threatening to live on until the next century. Nobody's grandfather had died. Nobody's grandmother. Nobody's parents. Only a few dogs. Tom Burke's beagle, Muffin, who choked on a bazooka Joe bubblegum, and then that summer, a creature who, in dog years, was still a puppy, Cecilia Lisbon. The cemetery worker's strike hit its sixth week the day she died. Nobody had given much thought to the strike, nor to the cemetery worker's grievances, because most of us had never been to a cemetery. Occasionally we heard gunshots coming from the ghetto, but our fathers insisted it was only cars backfiring. Therefore, when the newspapers reported that burials in the city had completely stopped, we didn't think it affected us. Likewise, Mr. and Mrs. Lisbon, only in their forties, with a crop of young daughters, had given little thought to the strike until those same daughters began killing themselves. Funerals continued, but without the consummation of burial. Caskets were carted out beside undug plots. Priests performed eulogies, tears were shed, after which the caskets were taken back to the deep freeze of the mortuary to await a settlement. Cremation enjoyed a rise in popularity. Mrs. Lisbon, however, objected to this idea, fearing it was heathen, and even pointed to a biblical passage that suggested the dead will rise bodily at the second coming, no ashes allowed. Only one cemetery existed in our suburb, a drowsy field owned by various denominations over the years, from Lutheran through Episcopalian to Catholic. It contained three French-Canadian fur trappers, a line of bakers named Crop, and J.B. Milbank, who invented a local soft drink resembling root beer. With its leaning headstones, its red gravel drive in the shape of a horseshoe, and its many trees nourished by well-fed carcasses, the cemetery had filled up long ago in the time of the last deaths. Because of this, the funeral director, Mr. Alton, was forced to take Mr. Lisbon on a tour of possible alternatives. He remembered the trip well. The days of the cemetery strike weren't easily forgotten, but Mr. Alton also confessed, It was my first suicide. A young kid, too. You couldn't use the same sort of condolences. I was kind of sweating it out, to tell you the truth. On the west side, they visited a quiet cemetery in the Palestinian section. But Mr. Lisbon didn't like the foreign sound of the muezzin calling the people to prayer, and had heard that the neighbors still ritually slaughtered goats in their bathtubs. Not here, he said. Not here. Next they toured a small Catholic cemetery that looked perfect, until, coming to the back, Mr. Lisbon saw two miles of leveled land that reminded him of photographs of Hiroshima. It was Pole Town, Mr. Alton told us. GM bought out, like, 25,000 Polex to build this huge automotive plant. They knocked down 24 city blocks and ran out of money, so the place was all rubble and weeds. It was desolate, sure, but only if you're looking out the back fence. Finally, they arrived at a public, non-denominational cemetery located between two freeways, and it was here that Cecilia Lisbon was given all the final funerary rites of the Catholic Church, except internment. Officially, Cecilia's death was listed in church records as an accident, as were the other girls a year later. When we asked Father Moody about this, he said, We didn't want to quibble. How do you know she didn't just slip? When we brought up the sleeping pills and the noose and the rest of it, he said, Suicide, as a mortal sin, is a matter of intent. It's very difficult to know what was in those girls' hearts, what they were really trying to do. Most of our parents attended the funeral, leaving us home to protect us from the contamination of tragedy. They all agreed the cemetery was the flattest they had ever seen. There were no headstones or monuments, only granite tablets sunk into the earth, and on VFW graves, plastic American flags abused by rain, or wire garlands holding dead flowers. The hearse had trouble getting through the gate because of the picketing, 
but when the strikers learned the deceased stage, they parted and even lowered their angry placards. Inside, neglect resulting from the strike was obvious. Dirt was piled around some graves. A digging machine stood frozen with its jaws piercing the sod, as though the union's call had come in the middle of burying someone. Family members acted as caretakers, had made touching attempts to spruce up loved ones' final resting places. Excessive fertilizer had scorched one plot a blazing yellow. Excessive watering had turned another into a marsh. Because water had to be carried in by hand, the sprinkler system had been sabotaged. A trail of deep footprints from grave to grave made it appear the dead were walking around at night. The grass hadn't been cut in nearly seven weeks. Mourners stood ankle-deep as the pallbearers carried out the coffin. Because of the low teenage mortality rate, mortuary suppliers built few caskets to their middling size. They manufactured a small quantity of infant caskets, a little bigger than bread boxes. The next size up was full size, more than Cecilia required. When they had opened her casket at the funeral home, all anyone had seen was the satin pillow and the ruffled cushioning of the casket's lid. Mrs. Turner said, For a minute I thought the thing was empty. But then, making only a shallow imprint, because of her eighty-six pounds, pale skin and hair blending with white satin, Cecilia emerged from the background like a figure in an optical illusion. She was dressed not in the wedding gown which Mrs. Lisbon had thrown away, but in a beige dress with a lace collar, a Christmas gift from her grandmother which she had refused to wear in life. The open section of lid revealed not only her face and shoulders, but her hands with their bitten nails, her rough elbows, the twin prongs of her lips, and even her knees. Only the family filed past the coffin. First the girls walked past, each dazed and expressionless, and later people said we should have known by their faces. It was like they were giving her a wink, Mrs. Carruthers said. They should have been bawling, but what did they do? Up to the coffin, peek in, and away. Why didn't we see it? Kurt Van Osdell, the only kid at the funeral home, said he would have copped a feel right there in front of the priest and everybody, if only we had been there to appreciate it. After the girls passed by, Mrs. Lisbon, on her husband's arm, took ten stricken steps to dangle her weak head over Cecilia's face, rouged for the first and last time ever. Look at her nails, Mr. Burton thought he heard her say. Couldn't they do something about her nails? And then Mr. Lisbon replied, They'll grow out. Fingernails keep growing. She can't bite them now, dear. Our own knowledge of Cecilia kept growing after her death, too, with the same unnatural persistence. Though she had spoken only rarely, and had had no real friends, everybody possessed his own vivid memories of Cecilia. Some of us had held her for five minutes as a baby while Mrs. Lisbon ran back into the house to get her purse. Some of us had played in the sandbox with her, fighting over a shovel, or had exposed ourselves to her behind the mulberry tree that grew like deformed flesh through the chain-link fence. We had stood in line with her for smallpox vaccinations, had held polio sugar cubes under our tongues with her, had taught her to jump rope, to light snakes, had stopped her from picking her scabs on numerous occasions, and had cautioned her against touching her mouth to the drinking fountain at Three Mile Park. A few of us had fallen in love with her, but had kept it to ourselves, knowing that she was the weird sister. Cecilia's bedroom, when we finally obtained a description from Lucy Brock, confirmed this assessment of her character. In addition to a Zodiac mobile, Lucy found a collection of potent amethysts, as well as a pack of tarot cards under Cecilia's pillow that still smelled of her incense and hair. Lucy checked, because we asked her to, to see if the sheets had been cleaned, but she said they hadn't. The room had been left intact as an exhibit. The window from which Cecilia jumped was still open. In the top bureau drawer, Lucy found seven pairs of underpants, each dyed black with writ. She also found two pairs of immaculate high tops in the closet. Neither of these things surprised us. We had long known about Cecilia's black underwear because, whenever she'd stood up on her bicycle pedals to gain speed, we had looked up her dress. 
We'd also often seen her on the back steps scrubbing her high tops with a toothbrush and cup of ivory liquid. Cecilia's diary begins a year and a half before her suicide. Many people felt the illuminated pages constituted a hieroglyphics of unreadable despair, though the pictures looked cheerful for the most part. The diary had a lock, but David Barker, who got it from Skip Ortega, the plumber's assistant, told us that Skip had found the diary next to the toilet in the master bathroom. Its lock already jimmied as though Mr. and Mrs. Lisbon had been reading it themselves. Tim Winner, the brain, insisted on examining the diary. We carried it to the study his parents had built for him, with its green desk lamps, contour globe, and gilt-edged encyclopedias. Emotional instability, he said, analyzing the handwriting. Look at the dots on these eyes, all over the place. And then leaning forward, showing the blue veins under his weakling skin, he added, Basically what we have here is a dreamer. Somebody out of touch with reality. When she jumped, she probably thought she'd fly. We know portions of the diary by heart now. After we got it up to Chase Buell's attic, we read portions out loud. We passed the diary around, fingering pages and looking anxiously for our names. Gradually, however, we learned that although Cecilia had stared at everybody all the time, she hadn't thought about any of us, nor did she think about herself. The diary is an unusual document of adolescence in that it rarely depicts the emergence of an unformed ego. The standard insecurities, laments, crushes, and daydreams are nowhere in evidence. Instead, Cecilia writes of her sisters and herself as a single entity. It's often difficult to identify which sister she's talking about, and many strange sentences conjure in the reader's mind an image of a mythical creature with ten legs and five heads, lying in bed eating junk food or suffering visits from affectionate aunts. Most of the diary told us more about how the girls came to be, then why they killed themselves. We got tired of hearing about what they ate, Monday, February 13th, today we had frozen pizza, or what they wore, or which colors they favored. They all detested cream corn. Mary had chipped her tooth on the monkey bars and had a cap. I told you, Kevin had said reading that. And so we learned about their lives, came to hold collective memories of times we hadn't experienced, harbored private images of Lux leaning over the side of a ship to stroke her first whale and saying, I didn't think they would stink so much. While Therese answered, It's the kelp in their baleens rotting. We became acquainted with starry skies the girls had gazed at while camping years before, in the boredom of summers, traipsing from backyard to front to back again, and even a certain indefinable smell that arose from toilets on rainy nights which the girls called sewery. We knew what it felt like to see a boy with his shirt off and why it made Lux write the name Kevin in purple magic marker all over her three-ring binder and even on her bras and panties. And we understood her rage coming home one day to find that Mrs. Lisbon had soaked her things in Clorox, bleaching all the Kevins out. We knew the pain of winter wind rushing up your skirt and the ache of keeping your knees together in class and how drab and infuriating it was to drum rope while the boys played baseball. We could never understand why the girls cared so much about being mature, or why they felt compelled to compliment each other, but sometimes, after one of us had read a long portion of the diary out loud, we had to fight back the urge to hug one another, or tell each other how pretty we were. We felt the imprisonment of being a girl, the way it made your mind active and dreamy, and how you ended up knowing which colors went together. We knew that the girls were our twins, that we all existed in space like animals with identical skins, and that they knew everything about us, though we couldn't fathom them at all. We knew finally that the girls were really women in disguise, and that they understood love and even death, and that our job was merely to create the noise that seemed to fascinate them. As the diary progresses, Cecilia begins to recede from her sisters and, in fact, from personal narrative of any kind. The first person singular ceases almost entirely, the effect akin to a camera's pulling away from the characters at the end of a movie to show, in a series of dissolves, their house, 
street, city, country, and finally planet, which not only dwarfs but obliterates them. A precocious prose turns to impersonal subjects, the commercial of the weeping Indian paddling his canoe along a polluted stream, or the body counts from the evening war. In its last third, the diary shows two rotating moods. In romantic passages, Cecilia despairs over the demise of our elm trees. In cynical entries, she suggests the trees aren't sick at all, and that the deforesting is a plot to make everything flat. Occasional references to this or that conspiracy theory crop up, the Illuminati, the military-industrial complex, but she only faints in that direction, as though the names are so many vague chemical pollutants. From invective, she shifts without pause into her poetic reveries again. A couplet about someone from a poem she never finished is quite nice, we think. The trees like lungs filling with air. My sister, the mean one, pulling my hair. The fragment is dated June 26th three days after she returned from the hospital, when we used to see her lying in the front yard grass. Little is known of Cecilia's state of mind on the last day of her life. According to Mr. Lisbon, she seemed pleased about her party. When he went downstairs to check on the preparations, he found Cecilia standing on a chair, tying balloons to the ceiling with red and blue ribbons. I told her to get down. The doctor said she shouldn't hold her hands over her head because of the stitches. She did as commanded, and spent the rest of the day lying on the rug in her bedroom, staring up at her Zodiac mobile and listening to the odd Celtic record she'd gotten through a mail-order house. It was always some soprano singing about marshes and dead roses. The melancholic music alarmed Mr. Lisbon, comparing it as he did to the optimistic tunes of his own youth, but passing down the hall he realized that it was certainly no worse than Lux's howling rock music or even the inhuman screech of Teresa's ham radio. From two in the afternoon on, Cecilia soaked in the bathtub. It wasn't unusual for her to take marathon baths, but after what had happened the last time, Mr. and Mrs. Lisbon took no chances. We made her leave the door open a crack, Mrs. Lisbon said. She didn't like it, of course, and now she had new ammunition. That psychiatrist had said Seal was at the age where she needed a lot of privacy. Throughout the afternoon, Mr. Lisbon kept coming up with excuses to pass by the bathroom. I'd wait to hear a splash, then I'd go on past. We'd taken everything sharp out of there, of course. At 4.30, Mrs. Lisbon sent Lux up to check on Cecilia. When she came back downstairs, she seemed unconcerned, and nothing about her demeanor suggested she had an inkling about what her sister would do later that day. She's fine, Lux said. She's stinking up the place with those bath salts. At 5.30, Cecilia got out of the bath and dressed for the party. Mrs. Lisbon heard her going back and forth between her sister's two bedrooms. Bonnie shared with Mary, Therese with Lux. The rattling of her bracelets comforted her parents because it allowed them to keep track of her movements, like an animal with a bell on its collar. From time to time during the hours before we arrived, Mrs. Lisbon heard the tinkling of Cecilia's bracelets as she went up and down the stairs, trying on different shoes. According to what they told us later on separate occasions, and in separate states, Mr. and Mrs. Lisbon didn't find Cecilia's behavior strange during the party. She was always quiet with company, Mrs. Lisbon said, and perhaps because of their lack of socializing, Mr. and Mrs. Lisbon remembered the party was a successful event. Mrs. Lisbon, in fact, was surprised when Cecilia asked to be excused. I thought she was having a nice time. Even at this point, the other girls didn't act as though they knew what was about to happen. Tom Fairheim recalls Mary telling him about a jumper she wanted to buy at Penny's. Therese and Tim Winner discussed their anxiety over getting into an Ivy League college. From clues later discovered, it appears Cecilia's ascent to her bedroom was not as quick as we remember it. She took time, for instance, between leaving us and reaching the upstairs, to drink juice from a can of pears. She left the can on the counter, punctured with only one hole in disregard of Mrs. Lisbon's prescribed method. Either before or after drinking the juice, she went to the back door, 
I thought they were sending her on a trip, Mrs. Pitsenberger said. She was carrying a suitcase. No suitcase was ever found. We can only explain Mrs. Pitsenberger's testimony as the hallucination of a bifocal wearer, or a prophecy of the later suicides where luggage played such a central motif. Whatever the truth, Mrs. Pitsenberger saw Cecilia close the back door, and it was only seconds later that she climbed the stairs, as we so distinctly heard from below. She flipped on the lights in her bedroom as she entered, though it was still light out. Across the street, Mr. Buell saw her open her bedroom window. I waved her, but she didn't see me, he told us. Just then, his wife groaned from the other room. He didn't hear about Cecilia until after the EMS truck had come and gone. Unfortunately, we had problems of our own, he said. He went to check on his sick spouse, just as Cecilia stuck her head out the window into the pink, humid, pillowing air.